let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer as we begin the service tonight. And I want to thank you all for praying for my wife. Uh, she was pretty excited today. The uh, doctor, the surgeon, said when she did the last surgery that she didn't think she got all the cancer. But uh, the pathology report showed today that they got all the cancer and that she is cancer-free. So we praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> Does anyone have a prayer request? Sister Jeanette? Pray for Vanessa. Yes, amen. Continue praying for her. Amen. Till we get a positive report. Sister. For who? Yes. Pray for Janice. Uh, that through this revival, God will draw her, that she'll come to church, and the Lord will do something great in her life, save her soul. Amen. Anybody else? Okay. Pray for the church down there, Josh and M's church. Amen. And Sister Gallagher. Uh, anybody else have a prayer request? Sister Jeanette? Amen. Amen. Pray for this family. Uh, I'd encourage y'all to write out your prayer request and just put them on the altar uh, of requests that you'd like to see God do during this revival. And uh, I wrote out some. And uh, just encourage y'all to just go by and read the request when you're praying and uh, ask God to intervene because I really believe if we'll take time to pray, God will answer. He said, you have not because what? Because you don't even ask. And uh, he wants us to ask. So I'd encourage you to write out your request and put them on the altar. And, and just any time that you want to come over and pray uh, between now and Sunday uh, to just ask God to do something in your behalf. Uh, and I believe he'll do that, too. Amen. I want us to have a great revival, a mighty move of God. We've, uh, this, this generation has not experienced the power of God like it's available. And I would love to see the Lord just pour out his spirit upon us during this revival. And I'm looking for it. I really am looking for some mighty healings and some a move of God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just ask him to have his way in the service tonight. Pray for Brother Christopher Wright. He's going to be preaching for us that God will use him. Father, we're so grateful tonight for your love, your mercy. God, for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, we just say thank you. Thank you for every blessing. Thank you, God, for every prayer you've answered. Lord, so many times we've called on you. And Lord, we just thank you for you answering, God, many times when we didn't even go back and look at it after we had asked. But God, we ask tonight that you would move in this service, that your power would be poured out upon this service tonight, that you would touch the hearts of every individual that comes. God, that you'd move in each life. I pray, God, for Brother Christopher Wright, that you'd anoint him. Lord, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost might be upon him, that he would speak to us tonight that that you won't said. And we pray, Lord, for each one of these needs, each one, God, that uh, I know there's some that's experiencing bereavement, that they need uh, uh, a touch, God, in the family. Would you do that for them? We pray, Lord, for those that uh, need to be saved. God, there's uh, so many of the folks that's connected with our church that has children that's lost, and such as Janet, God, that needs salvation. She needs to be saved, and God, she needs a move of God to touch her. We pray that the Holy Ghost would go there and begin to draw these that are lost, that they'd want to come, and God, that you might save them, that you might do a miracle in their lives. I pray that you would stir up the, the Spirit of God in the hearts of our people tonight, Lord, that they would want to get involved in this revival as far as inviting people and praying for people and, and having a 
desire to see you move and save souls and, and God to fill with the Holy Ghost and to heal and do miracles, God, among your church and your people again. We want to yield ourselves to you, God, for you to do that. I pray you answer every one of these requests that's given in. Especially we pray for Vanessa, God, that you would touch her, that you would uh, just do a work, Lord, to give her the joy of the Lord while she's there uh, in the jail. And God, make her a minister, God, while she's there to help others and be used of you, God, while she's there. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, set her free, that you would move in her behalf. We just pray, Lord, that you would do things and show yourself strong, God, in behalf of your people. Oh, we love you and we praise you tonight. And Oh, Holy Ghost, we welcome you to come and have your way in our hearts and our lives tonight. We just love you, Lord, and we appreciate you tonight. We give you all the praise and the glory, Lord. We just thank you and love you. And God, we're not ashamed of you. We're not ashamed to worship you. We're not ashamed, Lord, to lift our hands and lift our voices and give you praise that you so deserve. We just thank you and love you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just clap our hands and give the Lord a good praise offering. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every prayer you've answered, Lord. Thank you for healing and touching lives. And we thank you in advance, Lord, for the salvation of those that we love and care for. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Could you just lift your voice and praise him? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is not a social gathering. This is a time to praise and worship God to open our hearts and our spirits and receive from him. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. Get to where it's comfortable saying hallelujah. It's comfortable saying praise the Lord. It's comfortable raising your hands and worshiping him. Who's going to do it if we don't? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I ought to just have a whole service of just praising and worshiping the Lord. Glory to God, to help God's people get loose again because he inhabits the praise of his people. He comes down and gets in the midst of it. Hallelujah. Lift your hands one more time and just tell him you love him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not ashamed, Lord, to praise you, to worship you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 You know what you can say? Man, I'm tired. This body's tired. But hey, we're breaking out of that. Amen. The carnal man has got to lay down. 
because the spiritual man's come to say that he's in charge. Amen. This time, Brother Gary's going to come lead us some singing. Let's worship the Lord from the bottom of our hearts. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, I believe we've all got something to be grateful for, don't we? Amen. I'm grateful to see Sister Linda Kiefer here tonight. Amen. It's a joy to have you back in church, Sister Linda. Amen. We've missed you. Amen. And uh, I know from time to time your bodies are... Uh, I know Brother Thomas, last Sunday, he preached up here and had to hold on to the pulpit several times to keep from falling over. Um, he was weary. And I know uh, with this sickness that I've went through, it's uh, it's hard to me maintain my focus a lot of times. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough deal. But I think we could all say tonight, thank you, Lord, for the desire we do have. And thank you for the strength that we do have. Amen. And while we all wish it was more, thank you, Lord, for what you did give us. Amen. And uh, I think the same is true with our understanding. Um, there's a lot of things I believe that we've got to hold to, and we could say I'm, I'm fully persuaded and I'm convinced. And I think there's a lot of things that we have questions about. Amen? Well, maybe I just do. <laughs> maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I love this old song, We Will Understand It Better by and by. Amen. And to know that God has an answer and that He one day will reveal it to us. That's enough for now to hold on to. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's sing it tonight. We'll understand it better by and by. Here we're often tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. Rolling clouds and howling tempests off succeed the bright sunshine. In that land of perfect day, when the mist is rolled away, we will understand it better by and by. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathering home. We'll tell our story just how we overcome and we'll under better by and by. We are often destitute of the things that life demands. Want of shelter and of food with thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word. We will understand it better by and by. Oh, yes, by and by when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathering home, we'll tell our story just how we overcome. Understand it better by and by. Trials are hard on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die, and we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, yes, by and by, when the morning comes, when all saints of God are gathering home. We'll tell our story just how we overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Here temptations, hidden snares often take us unaware and our hearts are made to bleed by some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we're just trying to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, yes, by and by when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathering home, we'll tell our 
our story just how we overcome and we'll understand it better by and by oh yes it's by and by when the morning comes when all the saints of God are gathering home we'll tell our story of how we overcome understand it better by and by amen praise God for the hope of knowing how it all is going to end hallelujah praise the Lord you may be seated oh by and by when the morning comes when all the saints of God are gathered home. We will tell the story how we've overcome when we understand it better by and by. Praise God. Hallelujah. There is going to be an awakening one of these days. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Does anyone have a testimony without me calling on you tonight? Brother Wells is going to testify. Hallelujah. Amen. Who do you want to testify, Brother Wells? Yeah, who do you want to testify? Well, he'll stand up and testify. Amen. That is so true, Brother Bryce. Who would you like to have testify? Sister Linda Kiefer. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. 
Amen. 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 We're glad to have you back home, Sister Linda. Amen. Brother Jeff, stand up and testify. Good to have you in church tonight. Yeah. true, Brother Jeff. This time we're going to come to you for the evening offering, give you opportunity to give. And that's what it is. It's a, a blessing to be able to give. Amen. Brother Dave, pray over the offering if you would. Lord, we'll bless you for it. We got a special tonight. Uh, come on. You going you gonna go to your granny? Get her to help you? You don't need no help? Oh, okay.
you think she did awesome? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Got a beautiful voice and just wanted to use it for the Lord. Amen. Without any further ado, Brother Christopher Wright's going to come preach for us. true and living God. <clears throat> you know, I'm a firm believer that I get excited when we hear about a revival or a revivalist coming into town, but at the same time, I always have the mindset, we don't need to wait for the out-of-town preacher to show up. We don't need to wait for the set of revival services to have revival. Because we know as Christians that revival is a renewed zeal to obey God. And so we have that opportunity to do that every single day of our life and cry out to God and usher in a spirit of revival so that when the revival preacher does show up, the table's already set. He's encountering a people that are on fire for God, that are ready to, to, to walk into the fire with God. And so it makes the job of every preacher so much easier because he's preaching on wings of faith instead of having to prime the pump and prime the pump and prime the pump and get people and get some old quiet Pentecostals to lift their voice. So don't be those people. Be some good, boisterous, Holy Ghost filled, loud Pentecostals. Let them hear you out there on Templeton Gap. Let them hear you out on Union. Let them hear what God has done for your life. And I didn't mean to do that because I have to be honest with you. Tonight I have something really serious and really heavy to preach about. And it's going to be really important for this preacher to stay focused. Not get too emotional and chase down rabbit trails and running after shiny pennies. But I need to stay on point. Because I believe that God wants to do something here tonight. I believe that God wants to deliver some folks from some stuff. And as I've been fasting and praying and leading up to this day, leading up to this evening, God's been just breaking my heart with things that I know that people are going through, that I'm going through, that others are going through in this last and perilous day. But we're not without help and we're not without joy and we're not without the answer, but sometimes things just get a little bit confusing and we don't know how to deal with what's coming against us. And I pray tonight that God is gonna give us some direction in that regard, that God is gonna show us some things through his word that are gonna help us prevail in the spiritual battle that we are destined to walk in. So I want to do things just a little bit different tonight rather than having you stand and read a scripture because if I do that, I'm going to read the entire seventh chapter, almost the entire seventh chapter of Romans. And I think the better thing would be for me to just dig into that um, as we go because we have some significant ground to cover. And so let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord, because there's none like you. Oh, Lord, you've been so good, so good to us. You're such a great and loving God and so full of mercy and loving kindness toward us. And oh, Lord, I give you thanks and praise, Father God, that as we come to indulge in what is called the foolishness of preaching, Lord, I pray, Father God, that we don't preach for 
our own recognition, that we don't preach to be stars on YouTube, but we preach, Father God, to lift up the name of Jesus. We preach, O oh God, to bring you great glory. And we pray tonight, Father God, that whatever comes through this little sermon, Father God, that you would be glorified, that your name would be magnified, that your person would be glorified to the extent that everyone in this room would experience deliverance and love you all that much more. And Lord, I thank you. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for your unfathomable grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. You know, this age that we're living in, this last an evil day is fraught with tension because on the one hand we sense all the evil in the atmosphere we sense this heightened sense of oppression that people that Christians are suffering under they're being attacked in unprecedented ways that they've never experienced in their life before and Sometimes it's a new angle of attack, and sometimes it's that same old thing that you've been struggling with your entire Christian life. Now I know no one in Souls Harbor ever struggled in their Christian life. So I don't expect to get a lot of amens about that. But I want you to know that God's going to read some mail tonight. But with it, God's going to give a way of escape, and God's going to give a way to deal with the things that we have to face as the return of Jesus Christ draws nigh. You've heard me say it before that I always took the scripture, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. And I always kind of take that to mean that as the day comes closer and Jesus comes closer, that things in the atmosphere begin to get pressed down into our presence and all that wickedness and that evil that lies just above our heads is getting pressed down into our life to where it feels like the heat is being turned up so hot that some people want to give up. They want to throw in the towel, Natalie. You know what I mean? They're just... They're dealing with things in a way that they've never had to deal with before, and it's got them nervous. It's got them scared. They don't know what to do because they've never had to do this kind of warfare before. And we as a people are moving toward that date with destiny, toward that date that Jesus Christ comes back and everything gets redeemed. But until then, we have some things to face. But you know, Pastor Gary, I smell some desperation in the air. And I smell it from two fronts. I smell it from the aforementioned Christians that are struggling and, and a little bit desperate and in desperate times and desperate struggles and desperate battles and just really don't know how to deal with that level of warfare. But I also smell another kind of desperation in the air. If I was... If I was a spiritual great white shark, I'd be smelling blood in the water right now. Because Christians are not the only ones that are desperate, but the devil himself is desperate. Because he knows his time is limited. He knows his time is coming up. And so he's launching all these desperate attacks against your Christianity and against your character and against your identity and against who you are in Christ because he knows that the time is almost up. The, the time for his destiny, which has been sealed in the Bible, he knows what his destiny is. He knows he's destined for eternal torment and damnation in the cauldron of hell. But before he gets there, he wants to take as many people as he can with him. And if he can't take him with him, then he wants to make the life of the Christian as miserable as he can possibly make it until Jesus Christ comes back. But I want you to know tonight that that is not how we are designed to live as Christians. So there's got to be some fight back, but it can't just be random fight back. But we got to know what we're dealing with, and we need to know how to deal with it. So as the Christians are enduring the stinging assaults of this desperate, defeated foe, we need a lifeline. 
We need to know the true nature of the temptations we face and how to overcome them. Oh God, help us dissect this internal dichotomy that plagues us and bring us to the hope, peace, and joy that only your grace can provide. If you would, I want you to go with me to the seventh chapter of Romans. Excuse me for a second. So, in the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul, the Apostle Paul, does a masterful job of explaining this dichotomy that lives inside of us. And the dichotomy is sort of a, a dual, a dual challenge, a dual nature, uh, two things at war against each other, two premises against each other. And this is where we find ourselves. You know, the attacks of the wicked one and his lies against us is the external machination but points to this truth of these two warring factions that are both residing in our lives. So we need to learn how to deal with that. We need to learn how and what is at work inside of us. Because no one defeats an enemy if he doesn't know who the enemy is, if he doesn't know where the battleground is, you know, if the battleground is at a certain longitude and latitude and you're off in some other place, well, you're gonna miss the battle. You're not gonna fight the battle. You won't be involved. You'll just be cast off to the side. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants you cast off to the side and uninvolved in the battle and allowing him fertile ground to come in and just take over your life. But I want to start, now, I need to apologize up front, and <laughs> because this chapter is something that, that quite honestly, Pastor Gary, it would take me about four weeks of Bible studies without me hooping and squalling and yelling and screaming and, you know, doing all this in 45 minutes, but a classroom structure to really bring this out because there's things on the surface, there's things under the surface, there's motivations, there's so much richness and so many things in this chapter that you could delve into that for the paucity of information I'm going to give you tonight, I apologize. We can only really scratch the surface. But I'm trusting God that what I do give you tonight, what he gives you through me, will be sufficient to get us started down the right path of mastering the battle and being delivered from the things that are plaguing us and holding us captive as a people. So I want to start with chapter 7, I mean chapter 7, verse 7. And I want to talk to you from verse 7 to the 12th verse, and I've, you know, my Bible gives it titles, but I've given it my own title, and my title for this section is, The Law is Holy, and Sin is the Culprit. So it reads, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So we're going to stop there for a moment and unpack this just a little bit. So, 
the principle at work here is that, you know, Paul makes reference in verse 9 when he says, For I was alive without law once. Now, and I'm sure you can imagine that back in the days before you got born again, back in the days before you heard the first time a simple commandment like, uh, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, prior to that, there's nothing in you to convict you from doing anything wrong so you can sin and go about your merry way and you can lust and steal and do all kinds of things and you can rationalize it to yourself and you know there's nothing there to convict you but then once you come into the realm of salvation when you come into the place of conviction because if we're truly saved that salvation didn't start because we made a decision for Jesus that salvation started because we were in a room or we're outside somewhere and whether someone preached to us or whether we saw something on a television show or however it happened, but there was conviction. You were confronted with your sin and confronted with the fact that the way that you live your life and the decisions you make go against the teachings of a holy God. So it starts with conviction. And then we go through the forgiveness. We ask God's forgiveness and we ask Jesus to come into our life and you have a true born again experience. So once that happens, now it changes the whole dynamic of how we respond to the external world, how we respond to the things that are unright in us. And so Paul's language in this can be a little tongue twisting and convoluted, but we're going to make this as simple as we can. So we're confronted with the law. So our first initial thing might be to say, well, the law is hard. It's unjustly hard. I mean, if you're a sinner, that's probably the way you're going to look at it. You know, we, we can sit here today and we look at it differently because we're born again and we've had time to absorb all this, but the sinner doesn't have that. He sees the law and says, man, that's harsh. God is harsh. And the other thing the law does, the law is so crucial because number one, the law is the absolute voice of God speaking to his people and showing us what he wants from us. That's his voice, the law. But in the modern day, the law accomplishes a wonderful thing. The law brings you face to face with the unrightness of your life and when the, uh, the, with the unrightness of your actions and the things that you do with your life. So it, it brings sin into a sharp relief in your vision so that you understand exactly not only what God expects, but why sin is wrong. So now, that's the thing that causes a human being to tremble. That's the thing that brings a human being to repentance. But another thing happens that he talks about, and he says, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. Well, what does he mean? Well, ultimately, the law is pointing you to a way by which you can obtain life and holiness with God, but in the interim, it's producing death. Death to what? death to your desire for sin, death to your old man, death to the way that you want to go about practicing your life. Are you with me? So then he says, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. <laughs> it's a pretty another interesting statement. And all these statements take a lot of digging in. But here's, in essence, what Paul, what the Apostle Paul is saying. So, the first time you come in contact with the law, okay, and you get this expectation of what God wants from our life, and that he wants holiness. But sin is not through fighting yet, because it's in you. It's all around you. It's above you. It's beneath you. And so sin takes occasion of the fact that the law has just been revealed to you to bring up in you, as he said it here, I thought he said it great in verse 10, but sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Okay? Great 
King James word, concupiscence. What it essentially means is rebellion and it means covetousness. Okay? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Okay? So you're not supposed to be lusting after your neighbor's goods. But this concupiscence comes with rebellion. So now you're confronted with the law, and it says here that the sin took occasion by the commandment and deceived me, and by it slew me. And what did it do? It created in me an attitude. An attitude of rebellion. So I'm confronted with the law, and it says, well, you're not supposed to do this. And you're like, oh, yeah? Have any of you ever been there? I have. And so it's almost like that I dare you to, you know, when you were kids, oh, I dare you to jump off the building. I dare you to, and we do all these crazy things. And that's that spirit of sin that gets in us and wants to try and slay us. But the conclusion of that matter is that the law is not the thing that's hard. The law is not the thing that's unjust. What is unjust is sin, because sin ruins a life. Sin consigns us to hell and damnation. Sin ruins the life that we want to live on this earth. Sin ruins our chance to be one with an absolutely holy God, to walk hand in hand with him, because you know that's what he wants. He's not condemning you. He's looking for a way to save you. He's looking for a way to say, come on, bud, let's walk this walk together. Let's be in this life together. That's what God wants. God doesn't want you cast off and adrift and lost in sin. Are you with me? I know this, this is heavy. But after this sermon, in the days to come, go back and read chapter 7. And don't just read it. Get your tools out and study it. Dig in. You'll need to. And then the second thing that I want to discuss, and it's really at the heart of this, and I call it the dichotomy or the battle of will. Verses 18 and 20 in chapter 7. Now, this is where I have to piggyback off something that Pastor Paul talks about frequently, where he talks about the three levels of our existence, our spirit, our soul, our body, okay? Now, when we come to the Lord, when we get born again, as he's explained to you, your spirit gets saved. So that part, that spirit is born again. That's what determines whether you're going to heaven. That issue is settled. But there's this whole other issue of sanctification in life. There's this whole other issue of Christ-likeness and all these things that this process by which we hope that God is fully formed in us. And I know I'm not the only one. I didn't just stop. I didn't get saved on October 14th, 1984 and say, okay, got it made. A lot of people try to do that. And I thank God by his grace that I'm not one of them. And I know most of you are not like that. You know that there's a whole walk ahead of you and that there's a whole process of becoming more Christ-like every single day becoming more fully formed in God and more conformed to his image and bearing the family likeness. So the scripture reads from 18 to 20, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing for to will, and I want you to concentrate on that word will, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Woo! I got some good news for you. I have some really good news for you. But first, I want to talk about this matter of will. Because a lot of this that he's talking about in this chapter has to do with a matter of will. Our will is deeply involved 
in our Christian life. We can either will to do bad, we can will to do the do rights of God. But here's, here's the dichotomy, and this is the difficult thing. See, the will is encased in the soul, which is home to the mind, the will, and the emotions. But it's still awaiting its redemption with the saved spirit. This is why we struggle in our bodies, and this is why we struggle in our will and our decision-making and our emotions and all that stuff, because it's in that soul that hasn't been saved. Now, one might think, well, that's pretty unfair. You're going to save my spirit. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to glory. But I got all this other junk that I got to deal with. I got all this stuff, and it's dwelling in me. It's not like it's, I have to deal with Gary, you know, wielding a, a pickaxe at my head. No. This is stuff that's happening right inside me. Not easy, is it? But we're going to talk real tonight. There's too much fluff in church, way too much. And there's people suffering, and we need to hear where the rubber meets the road. We need to get down to brass tacks and get this thing right where it lives. I'm sick of fluffy sermons. I've had it. Because I know too many people that right now are all broken up and they're busted up inside. They're Christians. They love God with all their heart, but they're busted up. And they don't know what to do. And we're preaching pie-in-the-sky sermons. Come on. Yeah, well, that sounded like Joe Biden. Come on, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, we really have to get real. And so this dichotomy, so that now that we know, okay, that that will is encased in our soul, which is not saved. That's our soulish man. Okay, this explains why at times you feel so conflicted. And I know you ask it. I'm not the only one. There's nothing that I'm experiencing that any of you aren't experiencing. Am I the only one who says, I don't understand, God, why you called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and you set me apart to do this. But then inside there's this quivering mess and there's all these battles. And every time I go to preach, I got to overcome all that junk before I can get in the pulpit. And I'm scared to death. I feel like I'm driving to my own execution. Ask my wife. She giggles every time I'm trying to get ready to come here and I feel like I'm driving to my own execution. It's like your execution is set for 730. Oh, and by the way, you got to drive yourself to it. That old man, it's not because the, the war is stoked. It's always going on. He's always trying to talk in my ear and trying to talk in my spirit and bring me down and tell me what a scumbag I am and all this other kind of stuff. And we're going to get to how to deal with that at the end. But I want you to know for right now that that is where it's come from. So now this matter of will, I will to do good. Well, that's my spirit my saved spirit that wills to do good, but my soulish man wills to not do good. So he wants to get in the way. So we acknowledge, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. But the wonderful thing he says in verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Oh, I don't think y'all caught that. What I'm trying to say is the sin that dwells in you, the sin that dwells in that soulish man is the culprit. He's the one that drives you to do the stuff that you don't want to do, that you're trying to will to do from your spirit. Stop being so hard on yourself. Am I here by myself? Hey! Woo! Glory! And Paul's not saying that we don't take personal responsibility, but he's saying that that force that's driving you, that's not you. That's not your identity. That's not who you are. 
Oh, woman of God, he's trying to tell you you're Jezebel. You are not Jezebel. You are not the second coming of Delilah. You are not the second coming of Potiphar's wife. You're a woman of God, holy and righteous and virtuous and following hard after God. Can I hear an amen from the ladies? And if you're a man, you're not some worthless skirt chaser or some worthless dude that is behind in all of his bills and refuses to take care of his home, refuses to love his wife. No, you're a man of God, a man after God's own heart. Hallelujah. A man that God can call a friend, that he can walk side by side and walk with you through this journey called life and know that you're not alone, but God is with you because you are a man of God and a child of the most high king. Can you say amen, men of God? Amen. Oh, come on. That was weak. Come on. Let me hear you, man. Amen. amen. There's a culprit involved. It's not just all you, but that's what the devil wants you to believe. He wants you to believe you're doing all this yourself. Just because you don't love God right, you don't study enough, you don't pray enough. Oh, if you were a Christian, you'd do this, that, or the other. Hogwash. It's time to expose these lies. And then the third thing under this, what I call the negative thesis, the manifestation in our members. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now we're going to get really real. I'm not going to get as real as I want to because there are some kids in this room. But we're going to get real. Are you all right with getting real? You want to get deliverance tonight? Because I believe God is here to deliver us tonight. I believe the spirit of deliverance has been following me all week and is with me here tonight. And we're not leaving this place. We're not giving that preacher coming in from out of town a harder job to do than he needs to do. Tonight, we're going to experience some deliverance by faith. The manifestation in our members. Verse 23 through 25 read, But I see another law in my members. Now, before I go any farther, the, the use of the word law here is different than the use of the word law as it pertains to God's revealed law or the Mosaic law. That's God's voice. That's the law, the law of righteousness. This law that he's talking about, you could better use the word principle. It's kind of like saying... If I go to the gym today and I lift too much weight, the law of overexertion is going to affect my muscles the following day. I'm going to be really sore because that's a principle in our physical bodies. It's a principle of life, like the seasons and the, the flowers come up when they come up with the timing and the water and the sunshine. That's a principle of growth. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, we need to stop right there. And I want to talk to the people tonight, especially those of you that have a history of having to deal with the ramifications of lust fornication, homosexuality, skirt chasing, whatever it is. And even now as a Christian, you want so much to be free from it. You want so much for that grip to get off of your life. So much to be free because you hate everything about it. You hate it. But that part that hates it is that born again spirit. But then there's this war going on. There's the war of sin, there's the war of the flesh, and it affects our members, particularly those that are located just below our belt buckles. 
Is that clear enough for you? I don't need to be any more explicit than that. Good. And some people refer to it as a driving force, Pastor Gary. And back in the day, I was there. I found myself doing things I was so ashamed of. And I just felt like I didn't have any control. Everything in my spirit, was I hated it. I hated it. I hated me. I hated the devil. And I couldn't understand why everything in me was saying, no, this is wrong. Don't do this. But I was, it was almost like there was a hand on me that's propelling me with a force that I, 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 I couldn't resist. And you keep going through these cycles of sin and repentance and sin and repentance. And you said, oh, you're a fake Christian. You're not real. Because if you were, you'd be like so-and-so. He's never getting in trouble. He's a stalwart of the church, a rock of the church. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're just a dirty, filthy liar and preaching. But here's the matter. And this is where we're constantly getting tripped up. This is where we constantly, why we can't get the breakthrough in that area, why we can't get over it. And it's not just people that have sexual lust. It's people that, some people, God blesses, gives them the goods of this world, and nothing's ever enough. There's never enough money, never enough goods, never enough new houses, never enough road trips, never enough jewelry, never enough. Gotta have more. It's just a different kind of lust. It's just a different kind of degradation in your life where you're saying, God, you're not enough. But it's not just you. It's that soulish man in you. It's that sin, that sin culprit that's warring against the spirit in you that's born again, that's a believer, that loves God, that's on fire for God. There's a war going on, and it's a dichotomy in you. And we're not going to get the victory, Pastor Gary, until we know one truth. One thing that revolutionized my life before God, and I hope it revolutionizes yours, and it's really right here in this scripture. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And I can tell you that I've been around a lot of people that really know how to pray, and I've seen some eloquent, powerful, articulate prayers in writing, and I've seen all kinds of wonderful expressions of prayer, all of them powerful. But in my experience, Pastor Gary, I've never heard a more profound or powerful prayer than the one that says, Oh, Jesus, help me. Help thou my unbelief. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. Because what does that prayer say? It says that I know that I'm in powerlessness. You and your flesh and your religious rules and your do's and don'ts will never, ever get the victory over sin in that manner. Never. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Pastor Paul tells us we should have the do rights of God, and that should be our whole purpose, and you're preaching against that. No, I'm not. We should have the do rights. We should want to do the do rights every day of our life. The matter is in how we go about doing the do rights of God. If we try to go about doing the do rights of God because we say, well, I'm just going to do the do rights of God today because the first church of the fire of God in Pentecostal holiness told me that, well, I got to pull my bun up a little bit tighter and wear my dress a little bit looser and get rid of my tattoos and do this and do that and do the other. There ain't no life in that. That's not going to draw anyone to Jesus. I'll tell you what does draw people to Jesus 
is being in a place in your life where you know that the power to fulfill the law of God is all wrapped up in grace. It's all wrapped up in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary and you by yourself are absolutely powerless to do anything about that stuff because that sin nature is in you. The old man is there and he's not going anywhere until Jesus Christ comes back to rapture us up and then everything is redeemed together. But until that time, we have this battle to fight within ourselves and within our soul, and within our body. So now you know if you can bring yourself to the place, and it's essential, you've got to bring yourself to the place where you know that you can't do this in your own power. You can't do this in your own will. You can't do this in your own determination. I'm going to ah, suck it up, man. Come on. Yeah, I'm a big, bad country boy. I can deal with anything. Sorry. No matter how bad you are, no matter how tough you are, no matter how saddle-worn you are, you ain't winning this battle from your grit. You're not winning that battle from just your determination. But you're winning the battle when you get to the place and say, Oh, God, help me. Help me. I need your work. I need what you did at Calvary to overcome this dichotomous battle in my life. Can you say amen, somebody? So what does Paul say? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and he still acknowledges, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. But then the thought continues right into chapter 8. And what does it say? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law. Woo! He made me free. He made me free from the law of sin and death. He's made you free tonight. You're not on your own. You're not trying to get by with the stiff upper lip, says the guy wearing the British ascot. You're not stuck there says, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I'm here to tell you that that's how you do the do rights of God. That's how you obey the law. That's how you fulfill the law. You fulfill the law by surrendering yourself to Jesus Christ and counting on his finished work in your life. And that gives you the ability to want more more than anything else, and to perform the do rights of the living God. Woo! Hey! <laughs> you don't have to be bound. You don't have to be locked up in that battle. You don't have to be down on yourself and hating on yourself and believing the lies of the wicked one. But as long as you keep fighting in your flesh, that's right where you're going to be, honey. But you come out of that. And you say, God, without you, I'm powerless. Without you, I'm helpless. But with you, I'm free. With you, I'm full of power. With you, I'm anointed. Long as I step and walk under the shadow of your anointing and your covering, nothing can touch me where it counts. And that's in my saved, born again spirit. And then when the thing comes to my soulish man and my body, I'm more well equipped to say, God, you got this. God, I'm not going to try and deal with this. You got this. I surrender myself to you. I surrender the members below my belt line to you. I surrender the, my brain to you. I surrender my thought life and my prayer life and my meditations. I surrender it all to you, Lord. Now do what you do best and vanquish the enemy on my behalf. Crush him on my behalf. 
and something else follows from this, and I'm hurrying. Therefore, brethren, oh, sorry, verse 12 through 14 of chapter 8. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, hear it, through the Spirit, that's grace, not the law, grace, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, <laughs> yea, they are the sons of God. Woo! Well, I'm glad I'm happy about it. You are the quietest Pentecostals I've ever been around. Come on, Pentecostals. You got something to be happy about tonight. You got something to shout about tonight. You're free. You're sons of the Most High God. You're not refuse. You're not trash. You're not whores. You're not whoremongers. You're not evildoers. You're sons of the Most High God through the almighty, unfathomable grace of Almighty God. Can you say amen, somebody? Hey! hey. Woo! And lastly, this standing that you have with God in the spirit of the living God assures us of final victory. Oh, we're going to face some stuff, but now if we face it like this, we're going to experience more victory on the way to final victory. There's all kinds of people that want to come along and level a charge or level some condemnation. But what does the Bible say about that? Let's go to the 31st chapter. I mean, uh, sorry, 31st verse of chapter 8. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, woo, who? Who? Who's got the juice to be against us? Amen. Huh? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What does that mean? We're sons. We're heirs. We're joint heirs with Jesus. He's given it to Jesus, given it to us. Do you know what that means? He's given you power. He's given you freedom. He's given you joy. He's given you glory. He's given you victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over hell. You got victory in your hands and in your life. Now get that wrapped in your little mind and know that every time that devil comes to talk to you, that you've already got the victory, hallelujah, because of the work of Jesus Christ. Glory. Can someone say glory? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Now, what is Christ condemning there? Not us. Go back to that verse in chapter 7 where it says, For what law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Hey! That sin that wants to get a hold of you, Jesus condemned it, broke its power, broke its back, gave a spinal shot and broke that back. Sin ain't got no power over you unless you let it. Who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us? So he's broken the power of sin and he's praying for us. And when Jesus prays, guess what? That's an infallible prayer. It makes our prayers look like silly, meandering mess. Even when we're in the will of God and we're praying, great, ain't nothing compared to the way Jesus is going to pray for us because he's got the mind of God. He's got the heartbeat of God. He's got the ear of God, the whole Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They're all working together on your behalf. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? No. 
or persecution? No. Come on, sound off, Pentecostals. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or peril? No. Or sword? No. Hey, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not in spite of these things, not because we escape these things, but in these things, while you're in the midst, while you're in the heat, in these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hey! Woo! Hallelujah! Glory to God. That's the final assurance of victory. And that's what God's trying to get you to. That's how from now on when we feel that mess coming up, we acknowledge to God our powerless and invite him to come in and have his own way. And let him deal with the fire and the vitriol of the devil while you continue to walk and live in peace and have joy and not have your joy taken away from you and not believe the lies of the wicked one. And in conclusion, I want to share something with you that I shared with you before. And when it comes to that old booger showing up on the scene and trying to speak stuff into your life, you remember to tell him it is written. You're not going to outpersuade him. You're not going to impress him with your degree. Oh, I got a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. Ooh, you better watch out, devil. You think he cares about that? He don't care about that. He know, oh, I'm the pastor of Souls Harbor Church, Colorado Springs. Whoop, whoop de doo No offense. Man of God, love you, love you. But the devil doesn't love you. He doesn't care two hoots about you. And whatever you do, when you're in the midst of it, don't you ever, ever try to bargain with that devil. Don't you ever beg him for an extension. Don't you beg him, oh, can't you ease up a little bit? Don't ever do it. And I know some of you do. In the midst, you're like, oh, oh, give me a break. Give me a break. He ain't going to give you no break. And every time you ask him to give you a break, he's going to smile and laugh and turn up the heat even hotter because he has no mercy. He has no love. He has no care. He wants you to die and wants you to be miserable on your way to it. So when he says, oh, you ain't saved. Oh, really? So you come back. You get your sword in your hand and you talk to that old booger and don't ever get him, let him get the last word. Me and Gary were talking about this on the phone the other day, these attacks, and we suit too many times, we're quiet. We let him get the last word. Don't let him get the last word. Say, it is written that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've confessed him. I believe him. It is written. <laughs> Hallelujah. When he tells you, oh, look at your paltry bank account. What kind of Christian are you? Christian's supposed to be prophetess. He's supposed to have all kinds of money. Well, it is written that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God when the Satan comes to you and says you're all alone in this thing. There's no point because there ain't nobody watching over you. Whoa! Hang on there, booger man. It is written that wherefore seen we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, then let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Then let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
And let that devil come to you and say, oh, don't you even think for one minute that that work you do is going to be for anything. But the Bible said, it is written. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, glory to God. When old booger man comes and says you're without hope, it's getting too hot in this last and evil day. I say to him, it is written. Hallelujah. I had fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Glory to God. And last but not least, before you let this door hit you in your backside on the way out of my life, I want you to know that it is written. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So Satan, I've submitted myself to God. I resist you in the name of Jesus and now you must flee. Can you say amen somebody? Oh, I'm in a fighting mood tonight. Don't let that booger get the best of you. You got everything you need and it's right here. Get that word inside your heart so that if your Bible's not at hand, you got enough in you to say it is written and say it with authority. Oh yeah, it is written. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I want you to know tonight that if you'll adopt this battle plan, you get to know what's going on inside. Get acquainted with Romans 7. Dig in there. Know it for all it's worth. And you're going to start to understand some things about how this battle unfolds. And you'll no longer be the hapless victim of the enemy's lies. And I want you tonight, I want you to know that the spirit of deliverance is in this room. And if you're here tonight and you've been struggling, you've been beat up, you've been savaged by the enemy because you haven't known how to fight back and you haven't known how to deal with this and get that sucker off your back and out of your grill. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of getting kicked in the teeth by the wicked one. It ends tonight, and it can end tonight for you. I want you to all stand to your feet, and if that's you tonight, I want you to know that there is hope.